Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It is me, Legal Vices, and we are here for yet another Maritime Monday. So all of you that are saying I'm late, um, sorry, you're wrong. So go in or cause yourself. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, here we are. Uh, what's going on today? Where are we doing? What are we doing? We are going back to the Shackleton Expedition. You do not need to see part one to see part two. Part one was kind of the Reader's Digest version. That was the uh, that was the backup plan. Uh, not the backup plan. The that was the summary. <laughs> this is the backup plan. Uh, and why we're doing this is because there's this documentary. This is an hour and thirty minutes long. And I really wanted to show that, and I really wanted to show last week's, but we just couldn't do them both. So I kind of gave the a little summary, a little precursor, a little teaser, if you will, for last Monday's stream. So what we're doing today is we're going we're gonna to watch an hour and a half long documentary narrated by Liam Neeson about the Shackleton Expedition and just provide comment as we go through. We've got uh, a little less than two hours, uh, so we don't have a lot of time to, to mess around because at 11 p.m. my time, which is 9 a.m. Eastern time in the U.S., is the start of the murder trial that I've been streaming the past week, though we will be live with the court. And so that's where, that's what we're watching. That's what we'll be doing is in two hours from now. Uh, so until then, we're going to be watching this documentary and commenting on it as we go along. This is a story. This is a story of disaster, of horror, of survival, of, of the, the human drive to the will to live. You know, you don't, you know, cr creating drama, you know, creating you know, shit being, you know, Uber guy is not the way to, to, to prove your manliness. The way to prove your manliness is to, is to be a, be a Shackleton, to be a Sir Ernest Shackleton and go through the crap that he went through. I'm trying to swear less if you couldn't tell, uh, to go through the crap that he went through to survive what he survived on this expedition aboard the Endurance to Antarctica. That is is a man that is a man with ginormous brass testicles. They do not make people like Ernest Shackleton anymore. And today we're going to give a deep dive into the ill-fated yet surprisingly happy ending to the Shackleton expedition aboard the vessel endurance as he was trying to be the first person to transverse Antarctica. So, all right, before we jump into the video real quick, want to say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Yeah, you definitely do not want to miss this. This is a good stream. Alan, we have, we have Alan the Mod here. And again, we started a little bit earlier today because we have to be done by uh, 11 p.m. my time so we can start the trial on time. So congrats to all of you that are here and thank you for being here. Um, all right, Alan, it looks, uh, from what I can see, just scrolling through, you are the mod in charge, my man. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here in the chat and participating in the best chat on the internet. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, and for those of you that are just listening as we drive around the country, as we do our jobs, as we do whatever it is we're doing, thank you so much. Uh, just when you get a free bit of time, if you go back and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and uh, just leave a quick comment, you know, four words or more, just to let the internet gods you know, you, you know you're here. Uh, and for those of you that are here, please, only 43 out of 90 of you have hit that like button. So go ahead and hit that like button. Like button is what YouTube looks at most when determining whether or not to recommend videos. So that that is the matrix, the viewer to like ratio. Uh, you know, the number of likes is, is very, very slightly secondary to the ratio. But you guys are awesome. You always, always, always bring the likes. So please don't fail me now. I know it's not important to you and you don't think about it. But while I'm talking about it now, just reach down there and smash that like button or do whatever dirty things you want to do to that like button. As long as this video gets liked, I don't care what you do to the button. Uh, and thank you so much for the subscriptions, like, and subscribe, 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 subscribe. If you aren't done. So I'm assuming there's only 106 of you here now. So I'm assuming you're all subscribed. If you haven't, please do. And if you have subscribed, eh, uh, make sure you're still subscribed because YouTube is going on another one of its purges. All right. With that out of the way, we're going to bring this video up. And uh, the, the normal rules apply. I will try to do what I can to read comments from the chat, but the super chats, if and when you are so inclined to give them to show your support for me and to get your message out there, all super chats will be read. All questions will be answered in, in the super chats, regardless of what, uh, of what amount you choose to send. Uh, but again, it's not mandatory. It's just gratefully 
accepted, deeply, humbly accepted. And as I say, if you're going to, if you're going to throw your, your hard earned money at, at my face, then I will make sure that I read it. And if, you know, I, if I don't read your super chat within say 15 or 20 minutes, have the, have the mods get on my ass. Oops. I swore already <laughs> have your mods get on me, send something into the regular chat to go make sure I read your super chats. So that's it. And again, you do not have to watch part one, but if you want to go back and watch part one for the, the we did, uh, we did two things, three things last month, last month, last Monday in part one, we did the expedition that we're going to be deep diving today. We did a whiskey tie in because he also had a 1907 expedition to the Antarctic. Uh, where he tried to be the first to the South Pole, but he missed it by like 97 miles. Uh, but he abandoned his camp there and went back. But they found that there was several boxes, several cases of whiskey buried there. Uh, they just found them about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago. Maybe it was 12. But uh, yeah, so they, they, they brought back three bottles. They withdrew whiskey from a syringe. They had it analyzed and tested and Sir Richard Patterson, the nose, I'm sure you've seen some of the videos. If you've seen any of my whiskey streams, he reproduced the flavor profile of the original Shackleton whiskey. And now they're making it available to everybody. So we drank the Shackleton whiskey last week from McKinley's. And, uh, that's what we'll be sipping on today. As we go through, we'll be watching the Shackleton endurance expedition while sipping on that. And the third thing we did is just earlier on this year, they found the endurance, the vessel that is going to be the subject of today's Maritime Monday. They found it in almost perfectly preserved conditions at the bottom of the, of the ocean near Antarctica. And it's perfectly preserved because it's basically too cold for any wood eating organisms to survive. Oh, and Hyper Shata starts us off with the super sticker. Thank you so much. And with that, oh, why, Kitty? Why is it? Damn it, Jeff. What did I do now? <laughs> what, what have I done now? Uh, all right. So let's jump into this. We're on this, we're on this time constraint, and I don't want to uh, interrupt this and have to do a part two, part three, actually, next week. So, all righty. This is the Shackleton Expedition. Uh, and it is narrated by Liam Neeson. Shackleton was an Irishman and Liam Neeson is an Irishman, obviously. So I guess that's why they had him do it. And, uh, because we're just wholeheartedly copying this from someone who copied it from somewhere else. <laughs> um, I'm not having, I'm not holding out any hopes for monetization. If we do, we're incredibly lucky, but I'm not holding out any hopes. Uh, so, you know, any, any super chat support you want to give is fine, but not required. And with this, here we go. The. Shackleton Expedition. Welcome to Maritime Monday. Ah, yes, I already, I did cuss already. That's what it was about. Okay. And as we get going, let me know how the, how the volume balance is. If I need to change it, just let me know. And I know some of you are going to say it's too loud. It's too quiet. I'm too loud. I'm too quiet. Some will say it's just right, but <laughs> just let me know. I'll just kind of skip to the beginning here. Unless we wanted to buffer like that, which we don't. There we go. Well, and I guess while we're while we're going through this, I'll just mention that this all these all the pictures and videos here are actually pictures and videos taken by the Shackleton expedition. He wanted these he wanted this film to be made. I mean, he was, he was documenting every part of this. So these are all real and actual videos and pictures taking, taken by the photographer of the Shackleton expedition. Yeah. Do we, do we get some riff tracks with this? There's not a lot of uh, things to poke fun at here. This is just an amazing, amazing testimony to the will to live and the survival of manly men back in the day. whiskey. 
and I don't normally put ice in it, but I did today because <laughs> I want it to be diluted a little bit so I'm not liquored up and drunk off my ass by the time this ends and I have to start the all night stream. And this is also a, a Shackleton whiskey glass here. And Shackleton whiskey in the glass. And another, another super sticker. Thank you so much, Hyper. Hot dog and the cat. <laughs> Sup, penguins? Hypershot does his ice in the whiskey fits with the theme. That's how it was marketed. That's how it was marketed on the box. Found under the ice, served over ice. My father never, to any of us, his children, ever discuss that expedition. Occasionally, an odd statement came out, but he never let us read his diaries when he was alive. They were locked up. See, this is why this is so cool. We get the actual words spoke. of people and their children. We were young anyhow. We were a bit too young to listen to him. But apart from that at all, I never heard him speak much about it. The 1914 Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, under the leadership of polar explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton, would have been the last great journey in the heroic age of discovery. It was a daring scheme. A small party was to cross the Antarctic continent for the first time. I bumped the volume up a According little bit. Tell me if it's too much. Shackleton announced the expedition in a now famous advertisement. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful honor and recognition in case of success, Ernest Shackleton. Mm. My grandfather, Colonel Ward Lees, was always looking for an opportunity to do something exceptional. And such an ad would have been catnip to my grandfather. He couldn't resist it. Chippy McNish saw an advertisement in the paper looking for men to go to the Antarctica, and he said, he might not return. <laughs> so, he went and seen about it and got it. Five thousand men, from sailors to Cambridge-educated scientists, responded. Like Ernest Shackleton himself, they were drawn by hopes of adventure and glory. I had a dream when I was 22, that someday I would go to the region of ice and snow and go on and on till I came to one of the poles of the earth. Hey, we just got a raid from Ozzy Overlord. Welcome, Ozzy, and welcome, viewers. Make sure you hit that like button. had earned Shackleton fame and a knighthood, but he had still not realized his dream. Twice before, he had set out to claim the South Pole, and twice he had returned defeated ultimately losing this prize to Norwegian Roald Amundsen. And the 1907 Shackleton failed expedition was where this came from. The British imagination. Not all, however, were impressed. First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, for one, viewed the famous explorer as a mere adventurer and dismissed his latest project. Enough life and money has been spent on this sterile quest, he wrote. The pole has already been discovered. What is the use of another expedition? 
Welcome again, Ozzy Overlord and your viewers. Again, in August hit that like button. After seven frantic months of preparation, Shackleton and his crew of 27 men were poised for departure. But even as the ship set sail, the world in which Shackleton's dream had been conceived was coming apart. World War I broke out in Europe. Shackleton offered his ship and men to Britain's war effort. The Admiralty declined the offer in a single word. Proceed. Aww. Shackleton's ship, Endurance, was named for his family motto, By Endurance We Conquer, a phrase that summed up Shackleton's own drive and resilience. Absolutely. He was determined not to repeat earlier mistakes that had cost him the prize of the South Pole. Following the successful Norwegians, Shackleton brought along 69 Canadian sled dogs. Ah. Food supplies would also be depoted for the six-man sledging party that would make the 1,500-mile journey across the Antarctic continent. Shackleton's own ship would approach Antarctica from the ice-strewn waters of the little-known Weddell Sea. The sea's gateway was the island of South Georgia, the Endurance's last port of call. An outpost of humanity amidst the frozen wastes, the island was home to a handful of small whaling communities run by company men. Those of you just joining, make sure you hit the like button. Deeply appreciate it. A motley race of former noblemen and other fallen creatures who now hmm. strip blubber or render oil. Many, if not most, are at odds with life. Ernest Shackleton had something in common with these loners and outsiders. Born Dropping another Ernest, hot dog. He married the Thanks. daughter of a well to do English lawyer, but he was an indifferent husband and father. A restless soul, he had always been happiest on his far flung expeditions. He once wrote to his wife, Sometimes I think I am no good at anything but being away in the wilds. Shackleton was not your nine to five man, your commuting type. He wanted to be a great man. He was, he was searching for greatness, for reputation. And in a sense, I think he would have stuck at nothing to achieve fame and fortune. No spoilers in the chat, people, for people that haven't seen this. Let them enjoy it. and his crew <laughs> waited, hoping that unusually icy conditions in the Weddell Sea that Austral Spring would improve. <laughs> Expedition photographer Frank Hurley began his record by capturing images of exotic wildlife. See, this is what's so cool. We have all of this real footage from this real story because he filmed it. to financing the costly venture. This is all filmed from 1914 and 1915 of the actual expedition. That is so cool. And it's so cool that you guys are hitting the likes. We need to get up to about 200 likes really quick. So thank you so much for doing that. Make sure you hit that like button. Purse Blackborough, a young Welsh stowaway, sometimes served as Hurley's assistant. A stowaway. Blackborough. <laughs> had fallen Oops. in love with the Endurance when she had docked in Buenos Aires on her way south. Mrs. Chippy, the carpenter's popular tomcat, also along for the ride, had fallen overboard on the outward journey. The ship had turned around to pick him up. The crew took advantage of their last opportunity to send letters home. Navigator Hubert Hudson wrote his father, Dear old dad, just a line before we sail. We've had a very good time so far, and I think we shall do well. I hope to be home again within 19 months and go hmm. straight to the front. What a glorious age we live in. I mean, the, the balls of that man. I mean, by early December, he's like, I want to get done with this, this uh, take advantage of trek the across the Antarctic so I can come back and All fight in the war. That's glory. To the expedition. And behind him, Europe was at war. Twice before he had seen his dream snatched from him. He 
was now 40 years old, and this was his last chance. On December 5th, 1914, yes, he unfortunately, left Ireland will. and headed south. Okay, so they started December 5th, 1914. They didn't make it back in 19 months. But I mean, God, that was, those were men. That's what a man is. That's what a man was. I, I need to be the first person to walk across the Antarctic and do it as quickly as possible so I can come back and fight in the war on the front. What a glorious age we live in. Wow. third day, they encountered the enemy. The huge, compacted chunks of surface water known as pack ice. The pack stretched to the horizon, broken only by gaps of open water known as leads. The challenge would be to navigate the shifting thousand-mile tangle of leads all the way to the continent. Jeez. Again, this is actual footage. This is so amazing. Dr. Alexander Macklin, a Scottish surgeon and one of the dogminders, recorded his observations of the ship's high-spirited captain, Frank Worsley. Worsley specialized in ramming. And I have a yes. sinking suspicion this is Liam he Neeson narrating. went out of his way to find a nice piece of flow which he could drive at full speed and cut in two. <laughs> He loved to feel the shock, the riding up, and the sensation as the ice gave and we drove through it. Yeah, you can see, when you, they show the bow, you can see the bow of the ship is uh, reinforced with steel around it. You got steel around the bow. Exactly, you, you get to see it as they saw it. Some days the ship was held up by ice. On others, she made long runs in open water. After six weeks of travel, the endurance was only 100 miles from the continent when she entered a field of heavy brash ice, slowing the ship to a crawl. Captain Worsley recorded a fateful decision. The character of the pack has again changed. The flows are very thick. We cannot push through except with a very great expenditure of power. We therefore prefer to lie to for a while to see if the pack opens at all when this northeast wind clears. Yes, this is from Lee Spiderpod. I'll be able to when I finish. I'm going to put the link to the original but the original David, pirated the man video. Found the ice had closed <laughs> around the ship. No water was visible in any direction. As the days passed, the ice showed no sign of relenting. So they're stuck the in the ice. The event that sealed their fate was recalled years later in a radio interview by expedition meteorologist Leonard Hussey. On the 14th of February, 1915, the temperature suddenly dropped from 20 degrees above zero to 20 degrees below it, and the whole sea froze over and we froze in with it. An unexpected lead opened up 400 yards ahead, offering a chance to reach open water. And of course, yes, we I had am. no explosive to blast our way out. So we just had picks and shovels. God, these are the guys trying to break the ship free from the clutches of the ice. For 48 hours, the men attacked the ice. No, 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 no. No horror show here. <laughs> Sawing through the ice. Jeez.
Oh, it wasn't the name of the ship. It was the name of uh, the cabin boy was the same on the uh, the original Essex ship. And in a story Frankly, by Edgar Allan Poe. Man's exhausting bid for freedom, wrote in his diary. All hands hard at it till midnight, when a survey is made of the remaining two thirds, it is reluctantly determined to relinquish the task, as the remainder of the ice is unworkable. Just push the ship backwards, that's all you gotta do. But they're trying anything they can to get that ship out of the ice. Oof. They were trapped until spring, some seven months away. Beyond even radio contact, no one in the world knew where they were. Seven months. They had been stuck in the ice. Only one day's sail from their destination. Oof. Stuck there, no communication with the outside world. In Nobody diary, knows they're alive or Dr. dead. Wrote, it was more than tantalizing, it was maddening. Shackleton at this time showed one of his sparks of real greatness. He did not rage at all or show outwardly the slightest sign of disappointment. He told us simply and calmly that we must winter in the pack. Never lost his optimism and prepared for the winter. Optimism was at the very core of Ernest Shackleton's personality. Known to all as the boss, he was a born leader who was from his youth driven by a romantic quest for adventure. At 16, he had shipped out as a cabin boy. By 24, he was certified as a master in the merchant marine service. Shortly after, he was chosen as an officer on Robert Falcon Scott's historic first voyage. There, he saw tensions flare among men of different personalities and classes, thrown together in close quarters, and watched as morale eroded under Scott's inadequate leadership. Mm. Shackleton knew he could do better. That's the ship, Endurance. I just, it, it just fascinates me to no end to see these actual films made of the ship sitting now there stuck in the ice. Now was in trouble, trapped in the pack ice, <clears throat> drifting helplessly north. He will find you, and the he crew will kill restless. you. Colonel Thomas Orr Lees, the storekeeper and motor expert, irritated everyone with his superior airs. In a characteristic diary entry, he observed, I've made a point of sitting at the same table as the fourth officer, and the carpenter, who was a perfect pig in every way. But I've done this to try and accommodate oneself to ideas and ways less refined than one's own. Others shared his distaste for mingling with different classes. McNish, the carpenter, had a few blunt words of his own for the superior motor expert. Orderlies is laid up with a sprained back. He was shoveling snow yesterday. The first work he has done since we left London. <laughs> you know someone's a lazy and mother ever. Insisted the if it keep to a strict daily routine. If they actually write his first time working in the journal. <laughs> the dire penguins. <laughs> well, they're going to talk about it. Shackleton was prepared to act forcefully. John Vincent, a heavyweight wrestling champion caught bullying the sailors, was summoned to Shackleton's cabin. He left demoted. Everyone, including the boss himself, would work together. Seaman Walter Howe remembered. Everybody mucked in. It didn't matter who they were or what they were. Their qualifications didn't count for anything. <laughs> Scientist James Worry found himself assigned to a cleaning brigade. 
Everybody was prepared to join in whatever was happening, whether it be scrubbing the floor. And I think Shackleton himself, with his Irish background and ability to communicate and join in, made everybody feel that they were one. It was a team and not a them and us situation. He also communicated to his men that he put them above the object of the expedition. The object was great, but they were more important. Second in command, Frank Wilde, had been with Shackleton in 1909, when the boss, running out of supplies, gave up the pole in order to save his party from certain death. And how many people Wilde would do that today? Wilde turned back just 97 miles short of the prize. And they left their whiskey night, behind. With both men close to starvation, Shackleton had forced upon Wilde a biscuit from his own meager rations. Wilde recorded, I do not suppose that anyone else in the world can thoroughly realize how much generosity and sympathy was shown by this. I do. By God, I shall never forget it. How many of the accidents we've talked about on Maritime Monday have happened because of greed and selfishness the and just going for the prize? into pressure ridges became more difficult to negotiate. Ice claimed their entire horizon. As they drifted, Shackleton was mindful of the fate of the ship Belgica. She also had been frozen for a winter on the pack, and her crew had succumbed to infighting and ultimately insanity. Hmm. Turned to the dogs, who quickly became indispensable companions. You'll enjoy it. That's how you survive the winter in Antarctica. You play with the dogs. Hurley recorded a few words about my dogs. Shakespeare, alias as Tachko, the holy hound at Bug Whiskers, is a magnificent animal, somewhat resembling an English sheepdog. He is a noble creature, dignified in gait, master of the team in battle, and a leader in canine sagacity. Hmm. A good leader will ferret out the best track through rough and broken country, will not allow fights in the team, or indulge in capricious antics. A team of nine dogs can haul about a thousand pounds. My team is one of the best. No spoilers in the chat, please. <laughs> no, this is the part where they're having fun. They're, they're, they're playing with the dogs. They're having sled dog races. They're doing this so that they don't go crazy and mad during the winter. The birth of four puppies captivated the entire company. See, puppies. Tom Green, tough sailor that he was, became their adopted father. Aww. Well, is there a dark meat? Red wine would be appropriate, but... That didn't happen here yet, maybe. Who knows? Let's see. The man passed the long months with soccer matches. Ah. The theatrical evenings. Oh, jeez. I noticed how they really quickly went through the blackface part there. <laughs> with weekly gramophone concerts.
and memorable haircutting tournament. Thank you for the this sticker. Recorded. We do look a lot of convicts, and we Hyper are not much the, of that life at present. The royalty but of still hoping super to stickers. Get to civilization someday. By May, they had been trapped for over three months. The sun disappeared beneath the horizon, leaving days dark as night until the end of winter. Can you imagine that? Trapped in the middle of the ice with no communication. Deep piles of sledging supplies in the dark. mocked Shackleton's ambition and the dreams of his men. Meanwhile, ominous forces were at work. Ice, their old enemy, menaced the helpless ship. Under pressure of the tightly congested pack, huge blocks of ice buckled into ridges, threatening to crush her. In July, a blizzard raked the endurance. As the ice groaned and heaved, Shackleton paced his cabin. Captain Worsley recalled, He said to me, the ship can't live in this skipper. It's only a matter of time. What the ice gets, the ice keeps. The Endurance survived. But as winter turned to spring, assaults continued. Uh. Ooh, it just got goosebumps. This story gives me goosebumps. 40 years later, Sailor Walter Howe still remembered the ship. This is his voice. Rose. This is the voice the of the man on the ship. The starboard quarter and lifted her bodily, as it were. And then she listed very heavily to port. And the timbers began to crack and groan. Did you hear the timbers going as the ice tightened? Oh, you couldn't avoid it. It was there like heavy fireworks and blasting of guns. Together, uh. Shackleton and Wilde surveyed ice damage. Orderlies recorded, Sir Ernest must have gone through terrible anxiety lately. Though he is so inscrutable that no one could have detected anything unusual in his manner, I know for a fact that he did not once lie down for three days. And mm. I don't think he had undressed for ten days. Right? Tirelessly, the men worked to cut the ice away from the ship. You wait the, through the entire winter for the ice to, uh, to thaw. There were times when we saw it was no possible the ship could stand it. Everyone got our warm clothes put up in as small a bundle as possible. I have placed my loved one's photos inside Bible. In late October, the ice struck with renewed force, opening planks of the starboard side. Water flooded the hold. All hands manned the pumps for three days and nights to save the endurance. Hurley wrote, The ship groans and quivers, windows splinter, while the deck timbers gape and twist. Amid these profound and overwhelming forces, we are the absolute embodiment of helpless futility. Mm. God. Can you imagine being trapped in the ice for almost a year? And then right on at October the end... October 27th, 1915, 10 months after their entrapment in the ice, Shackleton gave the order to abandon ship. Seaman Howe recalled... Shackleton sent Frank Wilde along forward, who explained to us that it was a case of get out, Previously, Sir Ernest had probably seen the red light, and sledges were packed with as much stores as possible. You 
better remember that the sailor is a sailor, and that's his ship, his home. And once he's off that ship, he's at a loss. Mm. The adventures of the expedition, uh, the people that uh, that expected to stay and, and knew what they were up against, like uh, Tom Crean and Worsley, Shackleton himself, Wild. They adapted a little bit easier. Although it was still tough. They had been reduced to a fraction of their original provisions and to three of the ship's four lifeboats. Just wait, Aaron, you'll find out. It was minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And that Tents summer. and clothing had been salvaged, but there were not enough fur sleeping bags to go around. William Beckwell, an American sailor, recalled the lottery Shackleton arranged. There was some crooked work in the drawing as Sir Ernest, Mr. Wilde, Captain Worsley, and some of the other officers all drew wool bags. Hmm. The fine, warm fur bags went to the men under them. In the chill that's a, morning, that's a man. Shackleton gathered the company to explain his plan. Tucker Macklin recorded. As always with him, what had happened had happened. Without emotion, melodrama, or excitement, he said, ship and stores have gone, so now we'll go home. Hmm. How ballsy is that? We've just lost our ship. We've been trapped in the ice this for almost a year. The night We're going to go home now. Past, pacing the ice alone. The thoughts that came to me in the darkness were not cheerful. The task now was to secure the safety of the party. And to that, I must apply every bit of knowledge that experience of the Antarctic had given me. There is nothing that can crush a man as to see his dreams crumble to the dust. But on the other hand, he realized if the one goal had disappeared, we'll have another one. And so if I can't cross the continent, I'm going to bring all my men back alive. Because yes, that's Liam Neeson. That polar exploration was littered with dead bodies. Mm. This almost fanatic, well, it was a fanatic desire to bring his men back alive. This then became the driving force. It was the only thing he cared about. That change from aiming to attain what you had set out to extricating yourself from defeat is a strain that has broken many a man. It did not break Shackleton. Shackleton's first impulse was to march to the nearest land, some 350 miles to the west. Oof. The men were allowed two pounds of possessions each, with few exceptions. Hussey was allowed to keep his banjo, which Shackleton called vital mental medicine. Mm. But there could be no extra mouths to feed. On Shackleton's orders, three puppies and Mrs. Chippy were shot. Oh. I feel sure that it is the right thing to attempt a march. If we can make five or seven miles a day, our chance of reaching safety will be greatly increased. Mm. It will be much better for the men to feel they are on their way to land than to sit down and wait. But after three days of hard slugging, they were still within sight of the ship. Mm. The march to land had proved futile. Why, there was nothing to do but watch and wait. This sucks. <laughs> 
That's the death of a ship you just witnessed right there. Food and supplies were salvaged from the collapsing ship. Damn. The men scoured her broken deck, retrieving what they could and hauling it back to camp. Frank Hurley conducted a salvage operation to his submerged darkroom. He it was stuck in the ice, and the ice was the just expanding. The it just crushed the it. Refrigerator to retrieve the negative stored therein. They were located beneath four feet of mushy ice. And by stripping to the waist and diving uh -huh. under, I hauled them out. Jesus. This guy salvaged the Together, film. Together, he and Shackleton selected 120 negatives and sealed them in tin canisters. The remaining 400, Shackleton had Hurley destroy, so he would not be tempted to recover them later. Hmm. Hurley retained a single vest pocket Kodak camera and three rolls of film. On November 21st, the broken ship sank for good beneath the ice. Shackleton Oof. recorded simply. At 5 p.m., she went down. I cannot write about it. Now, nothing really. That's weirdly the choking me up. Long battle, <laughs> except Hurley's images. Mm. Oof. <sighs> wow. Once the ship had gone. My grandfather, I know, felt ill at e ill, not at ease on the ice. It was it was a, it was a new thing. I mean, uh, he'd seen snow as a kid, but never set foot on an iceberg like that. So it was a new, a new ball game, so to speak. In their minds, was like any human being. I think, how are we going to get out alive? How are they going to get out alive? They're trapped on an ice where literally no one on planet Earth knows where they are. The drift of the pack had carried the men 1,300 miles since they were trapped. Now they hoped the same drift would bring them to land. Uh. If not, they were bound for open sea. Hurley wrote, It is beyond conception even to us that we are dwelling on a colossal ice raft with but five feet of frozen water separating us from 2,000 fathoms of ocean and drifting along under the caprices of wind and tides to heaven knows where. Timbers from the ship were used to build a new home, Ocean Camp. The wheelhouse became the new galley. Hurley ingeniously converted part of the ship's boiler into a stove which was fueled by penguin skin and seal blubber. A daily routine was established. Hunting for penguins and seals became the main activity. Mm -hmm. Right. Each man knew rescue was impossible. They were managing to stay alive. But to what end? <clears throat> they had a pretty miserable time on the ice. But having said that, had a pretty miserable in the time. end, at every turn, Shackleton's enemy was not the ice but it was his own people in the sense it was the, their morale. That was the, that was the foe. He had to prevent their morale from crumbling. The ice was nothing. Anybody can deal with the ice, but to deal, to deal with the human spirit, that is very difficult.
Bad Weather Biker says, wait, I thought giant chunks of ice breaking off was a new climate change thing. You mean New York didn't flood from that ice breaking away? Apparently not. But it did crush the ship. After abandoning ship, a bite of sciaticus <laughs> sent Shackleton to his tent for two weeks. Oof. Emerging after his forced confinement, he made the surprising decision to attempt a second march to land. In his memoir, he related... Thank you for the super chat, Bad Weather Biker. A buzz of pleasurable anticipation went round the camp at this announcement. Nothing was further from the truth. Again, the man dragged the loaded lifeboats weighing more than a ton apiece hacking their way through pressure ridges that obstructed their passage. Mm. At times, they trudged up to their knees in snow. On the fourth day, McNish dug in his heels. Earlier, the carpenter had proposed to build a sloop from the wreckage of the Endurance. Shackleton had rejected the plan. Now, McNish openly rebelled and refused to continue. His duty to obey orders, he asserted, had ended with abandonment of the ship. Chippy was a man who didn't like being told what to do. You know what I mean? It's all one, it's all one who you were. If Chippy didn't like it, Chippy would tell you. This is the kind of man he was. I mean, authority meant nothing to him. Shackleton called the men together and read ship's articles, dramatically asserting his command. Despite the loss of the ship, he announced, all men would be paid wages until they reached port. In other words, get the fuck back McNish to work. back down. Mutiny was averted. No leader on the edge of survival can tolerate the least threat to his authority and Shackleton in fact was prepared to shoot the carpenter if necessary and he would have been justified because there was a hidden danger here that the carpenter was only voicing the opinions of two or three other members of the crew and more for all we know and had this not been crushed immediately the whole party would have disintegrated Yes, Liam Neeson is the narrator. Two days after the standoff with McNish, Shackleton was forced to realize his own error. He called a halt to the march. Mm. In his diary, Shackleton wrote, Turned in but could not sleep. I'm anxious. Everyone working well except the carpenter. I shall never forget him in this time of strain and stress. <laughs> A dude with balls that big, you don't want him to say, I won't forget you. Shackleton had put down the rebellion, but he could not quell all doubts that threatened to erode his authority. <laughs> A week of fight-breaking effort and had I will left narrate his you. worse off than before. Precious equipment had been left behind. Life at their new base, Patience Camp, would be much harder. What's up, Penguin? More questions arose about the boss's judgment. Food supplies were running out, but Shackleton had imposed strict limitations on the amount of penguin and seal meat stockpiled, insisting he would get them off the ice before winter. Lionel Greenstreet, the ship's first officer, openly questioned the boss's philosophy. His sublime optimism all the way through is, to my mind, absolute foolishness. <laughs> Everything was going to turn out all right, and no notice was taken of things possibly turning out otherwise. And here we are. Shackleton retorted. You're a bloody pessimist. <laughs> Jesus. For once, They've been trapped Gordon on the ice for like a, the fears of over men. a year. They had to have meat. He They've lost their ship. In the event of another winter on the floes. They're running out of food. It was and he calls the other guy a pessimist. To have, just like ammunition, uh, to have supplies. And the famous thing, the st statement of Wellington, wasn't it, that the army uh, marches on its stomach? Um, that seemed to him to be elementary. In 
In the end, it was the boss's vision that prevailed. Shackleton's great characteristic. Oh, was just the wait. ability to compel loyalty. Just wait. Even against um, his men's better judgment. Now, this has got to do with some force of character, some flame that burns within a man. Game grew scarcer. There was no food for the dogs. Shackleton gave Wilde the unhappy command to shoot some of the dog teams. Ugh. Early paid a last tribute to his old companion. Hail to thee, old leader Shakespeare. I shall ever remember thee. Fearless, faithful, and diligent. Oh, don't Within show weeks, us the dog. The remaining teams were shot, and this time, eaten. McNish wrote, Frank Wilde shot the last of our faithful dogs, of which we kept the five young ones for food. Our their flesh tastes a treat after living so long on seal meat, and this last 14 days on almost nothing. As the men drifted to the edge of the pack, the ice began to disintegrate around them. One day, Ord Lees awoke feeling seasick. The ice had become so thin that the swell of the ocean could be felt through it. Soon, nothing would be left beneath them. Jeez. Finally, Shackleton felt that they had to get onto their boats and make for an island to escape from the ice. The problem then was, where were they going to go? And there's an intriguing collection of island silhouettes which Worsley took with him, so that when they saw a bit of land, they knew where they were. Because otherwise, how do they know what they're going to see? Their navigation, however brilliantly it was done, was primitive. And they embarked on this boat journey from the ice, oh. not knowing where they were going to land up. Several landfalls were possible. The closest were Clarence and Elephant Islands, some 100 miles to the north. Deception Island, over 150 miles to the west, was known to have supplies for shipwrecked mariners. Shackleton chose Deception Island. Their three small lifeboats would carry all 28 men on a journey that would last no one knew how long. Sailor William Bagwell recalled the landmark day of departure. Our first day in the water was one of the coldest and most dangerous of the expedition. The ice was running riot. It was a hard race to keep our boats in the open leads. We had many narrow escapes from being crushed when the larger masses of the pack would come together. During the first few days of their journey, they pulled their boats from the water each evening to sleep. Without the movie camera, and with little film to spare, it would be left to expedition artist George Marston to record their tenuous camps on the drifting ice. I mean, that's a hell of a painting. Leonard Hussey and Walter Howe recalled the night when disaster struck. We were drifting over the sea on a piece of ice, and we were cold and frozen. Pitch dark night once, and then the ice split right across under the men's tent. With the eight of us turned in there, one poor chap named of Holness, him and his sleeping bag dropped into the drink. Shacklin looked into the crack and he saw a man floating in his sleeping bag. Shackleton grabbed Holmes and lifted him in his bag up onto the ice, Jeez. knowing he could survive only minutes in the freezing water. 
This was 1914, 1915, later, 1916. The ages came together with tremendous force. Oof. I remember Chaplin saying to Holmes, "Are you all right?" "Yes, sir," he said. "I'm quite all right. Only thing I regret, my bloody tobacco's down there in the drink." Cheers, motherfucker. Shackleton recorded, constant rain and snow squalls blotted out the stars and soaked us through. Occasionally, the ghostly shadows of silver, snow, and fulmer petrels flashed close to us. And all around, we could hear the killers blowing, their short, sharp hisses sounding like sudden escapes of steam. Great, now they've got killer whales to worry about. <laughs> Jesus, fuck! I mean, for God's the sake. The hardship of the rowing. My father said that at the end of a watch, your hands would have to be chipped off the oars. And it's very hard to imagine what it must be like when you try to get some sleep. Your hands must be totally frozen. Your clothes are probably soaked and you're hungry. The days passed in painful rowing and bailing. Stable ice could not be found, and nights were now spent sitting helpless in the Black Sea. To complete their misery, many of the men were now suffering from dysentery. Shitting on the boats, ugh. I think they only had one hot drink a day, and he said that they only ate a ship's biscuit, which in his own phrase, you look at for breakfast, you suck it for lunch, and you <laughs> eat it for dinner. <laughs> what kept them from cracking was Shackleton's sheer willpower, his leadership, this flame that burns within him. And this was manifested in different ways. <clears throat> Either it was Shackleton... Blitter fart, no spoilers. ...the consummate mariner at the prow of the boat, leading his little squadron to safety, or it was mothering his men, um, suddenly turning round and comforting somebody or preparing food for him and acting basically like a hen with one chicken. I, and the next minute, I hid your comment, Blitterfart, just because of spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, and yet they probably were seeing things of great beauty on that journey. <laughs> nice one, Glitter. Jesus. <laughs> we were all laced together, the three boats, on account of the bad weather. And during the night, the several whale, I don't know what species, was blowing around us. Had they gone over one of our tow ropes, the three boats would have certainly disappeared. And also us. For days and nights, with no sleep, the helmsman manned the tillers. When Worsley was relieved of his shift, he had to be laying on the boat and open slowly from his crouching position Ugh. like a jackknife. Overwhelmed by misery and fear, some of the men broke down and wept. Now Shackleton knew he must make for land at any cost. Changing course, they struck out for Elephant Island. Okay, we're going to just take a quick pause here to kind of shake it out. We've been going for an hour now. Uh, we've got uh, about 40 minutes left. Just take a quick little, quick little break here to, uh, again, say welcome to everybody that's joined. Um, those of you that know the story, no spoilers in chat, please. So the other people can watch this for the first time and enjoy the experience. Um, I mean, just the things that these guys went through. As, as I said in the description, and you, they just don't make men like this anymore. I mean, my ass would have been dead long ago, either through self-deletion or I would have pissed someone off or, you know, some shit would have happened. Um, no way. I, 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 I'm not, I mean, there's no, I'm... <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm making make, making no no predictions of grandeur and bravado on my part. I mean, these were these were men. These were men's men. Oof. Uh, while we're stopped here, uh, everybody, we got 414 people watching this now, 215 likes. So uh, jump in, jump in down there, hit that like button. Let's get us up to the 400 likes uh, very, very quickly so that uh, YouTube will pay attention and recommend this video to others. Uh, I mean, just imagine what these guys went through. They thought it would be a 19 month expedition. Uh, they had everything planned. And uh, like Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. Uh, they get stuck in the ice nowhere near where they need to be. They're a full day sailing away from, from land. And they say, okay, well, we'll just say, we just have to wait out the winter here. We'll just sit here on this little ice drift for seven months. Uh, they get through the, the long dark summer. They're in the middle of nowhere. Literally no one on earth knows where they are. Their ship is trapped in an ice flow. It's winter in Antarctica. The temperatures are ridiculously cold. The ship is is suffering from ice pack building up around it and pressure ridges building and slowly crushing the ship to death. After they survive this winter in the Antarctica, just as it starts to warm up, their ship gets crushed and sinks. So he says, well, I guess now it's time to go home. <laughs> so they march across the ice. Meanwhile, they're drifting 1,300 miles away. They pull these one ton, three one ton ships. They have to get rid of the dogs to survive. They get to where they're going. They set out for an island. They can't make it to this island. So now they've got to steer towards this other lump of ice, Elephant Island, with no provisions. They couldn't get to the provisions on the other island. And meanwhile, Shackleton's holding this in. He's holding everything together. And on their way, they find others killer whales and other whales that could just grab one of their lines, go over one of their lines, and all of them are dead. Uh, whew. yeah, they they the dogs uh, the dogs were eating more than the people, so the dogs had to go, and uh, they provided some meat. <sighs> so, yeah. Yeah, hit that like button, please. Uh, that's that's my. This is going to be one of the last times I mention that here, so I, I'll take it upon you in the next few seconds. Here, we'll jump back into the video in about twenty seconds. So pop down there, hit that like button. If you haven't subscribed, if you're watching this and you haven't subscribed to the channel, I would be deeply, deeply indebted to you. I would be deeply grateful if you would reach down there and hit that subscribe button. Let YouTube know you like what's going on here. And just a, a quick little uh, weekend preview from here on out. We're going to be watching, uh, we're going to be watching the trial, the Florida trial of the guy that uh, stabbed his girlfriend in the neck until that trial's over. Should finish within this week. Uh, but today, pop in later today, we're going to start that stream in about 50 minutes. And uh, I, he's on trial. It's a capital murder. The, the prosecution is seeking the death penalty. He got drunk, got in a fight with his girlfriend, stabbed her in the neck, slit her throat, and she died. And then he stabbed himself in the neck, apparently, allegedly, to try to self-delete, but it didn't work. Uh, today on the stand, I think that it will be his previous girlfriend that he got drunk, got in a fight with, and stabbed her in the neck. Uh, yeah, he's done it before. So she's going to be testifying today. We're going to watch that straight through this week until it's over. And then we'll get back to our reg regularly scheduled programs. Uh, yeah, it was the second time. Yeah. He, six, about five, five years ago, six years ago, he stabbed his previous girlfriend in the neck. And she's going to testify. Uh, Execution, thank you so much for the super chat. It's been a quiet super chat day. Uh, have you seen The Grey with Neeson? I haven't watched it yet. That's about survival in the Arctic tundra. One of the best movies, in my opinion. Uh, like, I think the last one I saw of his was a Walk Among the Tombstones or whatever it was, and that kind of sucked. But I haven't watched The Gray yet. It's on my list of things to watch. Uh, yeah, Stabby McStab, Stab, he's, uh, he's going to go down. Flux, thank you so much for the super chat, Flux. I'm really scared the defense has created reasonable doubt with the whole no weapon and all that. Well, let's find out. The, the prosecution has one or two days left to tie all everything together. And uh, then the defense gets it. So we'll have to see where it goes. Um, all righty. 
Let's do that. With that, we're getting right back in. Thank you so much for those of you that are super chatted. We still need about 100 super chats to make me super, super happy. And thank you for the super... Did I say super chats? I meant likes. Sorry. <laughs> hey, I'd like 100 more super chats too, but I meant, <laughs> I meant likes. Sorry. About 100 more likes to make me super happy and as many super chats as you want to give to make me happy. Uh, subscriptions would be great too. We've got some membership levels there. Uh, if you want to join the members, this is what we do. We talk about law things. I do maritime law mainly, so every Monday is Maritime Monday here on my channel, where we talk about ship collisions, ship accidents, disasters, and expeditions like this. Uh, other times we talk about social issues, uh, pop culture, and le legal things, and law adjacent things. We have fun. So with that, let's get back to this not so fun expedition here. Let's, and again, this isn't even close to being over, people. All of this shit they've gone through that's been documented over the last 57 minutes of this video is just slightly over halfway of their journey and their expedition and their adventure. <sighs> Let's get back into it and see what else can possibly go wrong. On the evening of the sixth day, the skies to the Northwest darkened and a gale swept down. Oh, lovely. Swamped with water, one of the lifeboats was in danger of sinking. <laughs> Thank you, Flux, for the super chat. Who up until then had disdained to go, rose to the crisis and bailed for his companions. Mocha Dick. <laughs> My grandfather was always a man who wanted to do a feat. Rowing, you're, you're, there's no possibility of, of doing a feat. I mean, everybody's on the same oar rowing like that, bailing out, saving everybody's life. Gosh, I mean, that, that's sort of a, 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 a part made in heaven for my grandfather, because everybody would be made aware of the fact that he'd been up all night bailing them out. So gentlemen don't row, but by Jove, they do anything necessary to save people's lives. Jesus. <laughs> now, now they're jockeying for who gets to save the most lives. These guys have balls of steel. When dawn broke, Shackleton recorded. The weather was very thick in the morning. Indeed, at 7 a.m., we were right under the cliffs, which plunged sheer to the sea before we saw them. Elephant Island. The men had been seven bleak days at sea and over five months on drifting ice. It was a year and four months since they had touched land. I don't know what that means, Cloud Illusion. With frostbitten fingers, Hurley recorded the landing. Oof. Uh, more than a year and they haven't been on land. Ugh. In his diary, Hurley wrote, Many of the party were emaciated by exhaustion, fatigue, and exposure. Many suffered from temporary aberration, others shivering as with palsy. The man reeled along the beach as if drunk, some burying their faces in the stones. Morty recalled more chilling behavior. Some fellows were half crazy. One got an axe and did not stop until he had killed about 10 seals. At least it was seals and not people, so good for him. Shackleton ordered food prepared. It was the first hot meal in three days. Hurley described the first night. Tents were hastily erected, all turned in, and almost instantly were deep in slumber. How delicious to wake in one's sleep and listen to the croaks of penguins mingling with the sea. To fall asleep and awaken again and feel this is real, we have reached land. 
Land, such as it was, was a low sliver of beach that offered no shelter. Mm. Two days later, Shackleton <laughs> led the man to a second location on the western side of the island. The new campsite was called Cape Wild, after Frank Wild. To the sailors, it was Cape Bloody Wild. The boats landed in sleet and rain. By night, a gale blew up, ripping one of the tents to shreds and blowing equipment out to sea. Oh, shit. There goes their equipment. Men Bye. crawled under the boats for shelter and lay shivering in their Burberry tunics as the wind heaped snow upon them. The blizzard raged for five days. I think I spent this morning the most unhappy hour of my life. All attempts seemed so hopeless, and fate seemed absolutely determined to thwart us. Men sat and cursed, not loudly, but with an intensity that showed their hatred of this island on which we had sought shelter. Mm. Shackleton had saved his men in the sense he'd got them all alive out of the ice and onto terra firma. But now how to get back to civilization? Elephant Island was off any conceivable shipping route. Not only that, she, she was nowhere near the routes of the whalers and sealers that used to come down there. So somehow um, Shackleton had to get his men to a port of call, even if it was only a, a lonely island where the sealers came. Staring down impossible odds, Shackleton made a bold decision. He would not wait. He would sail for rescue. Cape Horn, the closest land, was beyond reach, as it would mean sailing against the prevailing wind. But in the path of the westerlies was the island they had set out from, South Georgia. The plan was made. <clears throat> Shackleton would take a 22 and a half foot long boat, 800 miles across the world's most dangerous ocean. Fuck me, the balls on that man. Work began immediately on the James Caird. Earlier, McNish had raised her gunnels with wood from packing cases. Now, he scavenged the other two boats to reinforce her. The seams were sealed with Marston's oil paints and seal's blood. Her deck was canvassed. It wasn't so, only that McNeish was a good shipwright, a good ship's carpenter, but he appeared to have something extra. He had a, a streak of, uh, of ingenuity, so they cannibalized the, um, the two lifeboats the, the to make one lifeboat. This is it. This is the last to, chance. To make something out of nothing. And I think this was connected with a, a strain of perversity of cussedness. And here's another paradox. This, is the, this was the mutineer who'd come good. Shackleton chose the strongest and most seasoned sailors for the journey. Mocha Dick. <laughs> Julian, and for some reason, won't let me type the actual two words. Probably because I'm not a modtastic elite. He would be joined by Tom Crean just and Tim one McCarthy. Word. Just make one word. Both <laughs> Irish sailors and stolards of the voyage to Elephant Island. The demoted boatswain, John Vincent, was also redeemed. Shackleton recognized his strength and skill, the result of his years on fishing trawlers and the brutal conditions of the North Atlantic. Ugh. So yeah, they had Captain three lifeboats. Captain had navigated the boats to Elephant Island. Now they cannibalized to two to reinforce one, and they made and this rowboat into a sailboat. Pacing the shore, he checked and rechecked the chronometer that would be critical to his navigation. Yeah, he's navigating Wild, with a fucking watch. Man would be in charge of the men left behind. As the he's going through 800 time, miles of the most dangerous the ocean on Earth, and he's navigating with a watch. Partially incapacitated men on a deserted, wind-wrecked island. Taking five people in a boat, leaving 21 behind with no boat, no food, nothing. 
and he's going to go 800 miles to try to get rescue. Flux, who knows all about dicks, says, Sometimes it lets you say dick and sometimes it doesn't. I think you have to capitalize it to make it look like a name, lol. <laughs> On April 22nd, 1916, McNish finished his work and the weather cleared. They can't see the stars occasionally. You, you have to see the stars to be able to use something to navigate with. And he was navigating with a goddamn watch. Moored offshore, the Caird was loaded with two tons of stone ballast for stability on the towering waves. Water from ice laboriously melted over a blubber flame was stored in kegs. They took food for four weeks. Beyond this, they knew they could not survive. And that was something that Shackleton Standing said. On the beach, he said he only took one month, month because he would either get where he needed to go or he would be dead. Cheered the care on her way. God, this is the picture. Imagine being one of those people in that picture, waving this boat, your literal on last the fucking chance. Reflected. Out. The men this, this goes away. a pathetic group. As long as they thought we could see them, they kept up a wonderful appearance of optimism and hardiness. Elephant Island receded into the distance as the care departed on a day of rare sunshine and calm seas. Oh, thank you very much, Terry Shaw. Deeply appreciate it. Hey, sorry you can't give me more hearts. Give me as many hearts as you want. Love Maritime Mondays. Well, appreciate that. Thank you. All right, so he's on his way Soon 800 miles. What could possibly happen? <laughs> By the second day, the weather had grown severe, and water began pouring into the little boat. Frank Worsley recalled. Bruised and soaked with never a long enough interval for our bodies to warm our steaming clothes, our feet and legs had swelled and began to be superficially frostbitten with the temperature at times nearly down to zero. McNish alone attempted to keep a sea log, but on the ninth day he abruptly broke it off. They worked around the clock in four hour shifts. Three men vainly attempting to sleep on the rocky balance below, while three others held watch above, bailing, pumping, trimming the sails, fighting to keep the care afloat. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> they were in a 22 foot six little rowing boat, and it is absolutely staggering the height of the waves. I mean, there are waves, there were some incredible waves, and uh, some which might nowadays be called non-negotiable waves, where you'd head up to the top, and you might not yeah. even get over the top, and you'd slide back down. So they were, it was an extraordinary journey of survival. So yeah, if you go up and you don't make it up, you slide down, the wave crashes over you, and you die. In the end, everything depended on Worsley. He had learned to navigate in the high surf of the South Pacific, but nothing could compare to his present challenge. To chart the Caird's position, Worsley needed to read the sun's relation to the horizon, but the sun rarely appeared in the overcast sky, and the horizon became almost impossible to find behind the waves. Even to attempt a sextant reading, he had to be braced by men on either side as the boat heaved and pitched her way through the water. He's a sextant worker. <laughs> you mustn't forget, every degree mistake you make is 60 miles of latitude. And they only had about 10 miles leeway in 800 miles in order to reach safety. In 800 miles of stormy travel, Worsley was able to take only four sightings. The remainder of the journey he navigated by dead reckoning. That is so fucking phenomenal. His instinctive gauging of speed and direction, or merry guesswork, as he called it. 
Mary Guesswork. Execution says, nope, tried to send it. Seems DCIK day, is off limits. I believe that they were a little over halfway. He recalled, two of the party were very close to death. Flux says, I'm the only one allowed to say dick. finger on each man's pulse. Whenever he noticed that a man seemed extra cold and shivered, he would immediately order another hot drink to be prepared and served to all. He never let the man know that it was on his account. Vincent's upper lip was torn away by a frozen metal cup. Oh, God. Ah. Oh, God, he must have been desperate. That's all I can say. He must have been desperate. My father's ears, his two ears, suffered frostbite. They were like boards. On the evening of May 7th, the 14th day at sea, a piece of kelp floated by. Land was near. Worsley recalled this moment. We looked at each other with cheerful, foolish grins. The thoughts uppermost were, we've done it. Whew. With land in sight, new ordeals arose to test their limits. A wind drove them perilously close to the island's cliffs. Soon this wind increased into hurricane force, descending upon them from the darkening skies. This is where Worsley came into his own, because he understood the way a sailing ship worked. And so he performed a miracle there with a, um, uh, a round-bottomed whaler that, 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 whose, whose profession was making leeway not built for sailing into the wind. Somehow, he, he clawed his way offshore and into the wind. The hurricane raged for nine hours. Then, the wind veered, carrying them from destruction. Shackleton recorded, I stood offshore, tired almost to the point of apathy. On the evening of May 10th, the 17th day at sea, the James Caird sailed into the entrance of King Hacken Bay on South Georgia. They survived, right? Just wait, it's not over yet. In the gathering darkness, the boat ran in on a swell and touched yes. the beach. Liam Neeson. A small stream flowed nearby, and the men fell to their knees and drank. One of the greatest boat journeys in modern maritime history had ended. <sighs> but... Above them, the hill was green with tussock grass, the first vegetation they had seen in 17 months. McNish recalled, I went on top of the hill and had a lay on the grass, and it put me in mind of old times at home, sitting on the hillside, looking down at the sea. Damn Dick and Jane. Joe wins. Suddenly, <laughs> home, rescue seemed possible. There was only one catch. The whaling stations lay on the opposite side of the island. Shit. Neither crew nor boat were fit for another sea journey. The island would have to be crossed on foot. It was a terrible setback. I think that most men, under those circumstances, without Shackleton's leadership, they might have, uh, they might have collapsed morally there, and therefore not survived. He took it all in a very matter-of-fact way. He gave the impression that everything would be all right in the end. Their single map showed only the island's coastline. The interior was unknown. Icy and forbidding, prey to sudden blizzards and hurricane force winds, the whalers considered it impenetrable. This chaos of peaks and glaciers had never been crossed. Jeez. Yeah. 
They had just survived 17 days at sea, and their feet were still numb from frostbite. But if rescue were to be made, they had to reach the other side. Shackleton decided to take with him Crean and Worsley, leaving behind the other men who were not fit for the journey. <sighs> now he's leaving another group behind. Now they're in three Using different places. from the Caird, McNish improvised climbing boots. The frost of night would harden the snow, making it easier to cross. But there could be no stopping, or they would succumb to the cold. They were in a race for their companions' lives. Too weak to carry anything but bare necessities, the three men took a length of rope and a carpenter's adze as their only equipment. Taking advantage of the full moon and calm weather, they set out at 3 a.m. for Stromness whaling station. Beneath the deceptive blanketing of snow lay ice fields pitted with crevasses. One misstep could end in death. As the day grew longer, they struggled through a bewildering confusion of ridges and plateaus. Jeez. They have to walk across that. No one has ever done this before, at time night. Time after time, they would ascend a summit, only to find a precipice on the other side. Jillian N says, I did capitalize it, yet no dick allowed. YouTube Shackleton is a bar for ladies who enjoy other ladies. The it also seems to be certain L word is a no-go. We had done little walking since January, and our muscles were out of tune. Yeah, that's the other thing. By evening, they were again high on a treacherous pass, too steep to climb down. An it was of the utmost importance for us to get down into the next valley before dark. The night temperature at that elevation would be very low. We had no sleeping bags. And execution in a non-dick related super chat. Thank you for the first one. You never watched the PBS Shack documentary said, Storm Over Everest. We've got to take a risk. Are you game? Not we'll in slide. Oh, Jesus. Coiling their rope into a Not pad, maritime, but an amazing story. Highly recommend. Off. You want to Not watch what rocks or razor sharp ice lay on their path. We seemed to shoot into space. Quite suddenly, I felt a glow and knew that I was grinning. We finished up at the bottom in a bank of snow. We picked ourselves up and solemnly shook hands all round. Jesus. And Flex says lesbians. Hmm, maybe it's a weird YouTube thing. Why can I say all of this, lol? <laughs> can we stop talking about dicks and lesbians during this, please? <laughs> no, no, just kidding. That's the only super chats I'm getting. to early morning, they marched on. Continue with your lesbians and dicks. Wrote Shackleton. <laughs> at 5 a.m., we were at the foot of the rocky spurs of the range. We were tired, and wind that blew down from the heights was chilling us. I thought we might be able to keep warm and have a rest. Within minutes, my two companions were asleep. <sighs> no, no, please, lesbian and dick away. It's getting super chats. <laughs> I roll the non-maritime chats. Well, it's a truly fantastic story. Holy cow. They woke up. I realized it would be disastrous if we all slumbered together. Mm. For sleep under such conditions merges into death. After five minutes, I shook them into consciousness again, told them they'd slept for half an hour, and gave the word for a fresh start. Yeah. Get up, you lazy fucks. <laughs> you guys are useless. You'd never have done anything with your life. Let's go. God, these guys are just amazing. 
I mean, that's a stupid By word to say. Amazing. AM, they had but... climbed a ridge that looked down upon a site familiar from a year and a half earlier. Fortuna Bay. Stromness was around the corner. At three in the afternoon on May 20th, Shackleton, Worsley, and Green stumbled into Stromness Station. They had been marching for 36 hours. At the home of Thorold Surly, the station manager, they knocked on the door. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Who the hell are you? Surly reportedly asked. <laughs> My name is Shackleton, came the answer. The waiting manager couldn't recognize them because they were dirty, emaciated. They were soot grimed from because of living over blubber stoves for so long. Their clothes were filthy. Their hair was uncut. They were like men returning from the dead. Quite literally. Mm. That night, the weather turned. Lying in bed in the manager's house, Shackleton listened to snow drive against the window. Had they been caught in a blizzard, nothing could have saved them. Years later, Shackleton would give a mystical account of the crossing of South Georgia. I know that during that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. I said nothing to my companions, but afterwards Worsley said to me, Boss, I had a curious feeling that there was another person with us. Aaron, you'll find out. Just wait. The fourth man, I suppose, was the man above. They must be. De they must have be deeply religious at the back of everything. They must. That was the worst closed captioning I've ever seen. Three days after arriving in Stromnaz, Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean set out for Elephant Island in a borrowed ship. But it's not over yet. The three companions back at King Hakon Bay were given passages home. Sixty miles short of the island, the rescue ship was brought to a halt by their old enemy, ice. There was nothing to do but return. <laughs> rescue the next attempt four months, failed. Shackleton made increasingly frantic attempts to get through to his men on Elephant Island. At last, in late August, the Chilean government loaned him a small tug called the Yelcho, and Shackleton, Worsley, and Green set out on their fourth rescue attempt. Three rescue attempts failed. Elephant Island. The rescue party was now at least 10 weeks overdue. In his diary, Ordlees wrote, August 26th, 1916. Another wretched day. Very dull and draining. What little seal meat we have left is tainted. For we've picked it over so often that nothing but the most decomposed remains. The 22 men had passed a sunless winter living in a small hut made from the overturned boats. Twenty-two of us lived in a tiny, dark little hut. The weather was just appalling. Blizzards and snowstorms almost the whole time. The uh, great difficulties, of course, was lack of water. Uh, there was plenty of frozen water all around, but you can't suck ice at those temperatures if you do. It blisters your lips and your tongue as though you'd suck a piece of red hot iron. So we used to take a few chips of ice in our sleeping bags with us at night in an old tobacco tin. And if you lay very still all night, a few of those chips would melt and you'd have about a teaspoonful of water for your breakfast in the morning. Of course, food was very short. We had very little except a, a little seal and penguin whenever they came up. And Marston, who was with us, had a little penny cookery book from which he used to read one recipe per night. 
<laughs> we all lay around very quietly and very solemnly, suggesting in turns improvements and alterations. Then when the last man had finished, we went to sleep dreaming of the second helpings we'd refused when we were back home. You know, it's difficult to realize how hungry a man can be. When we'd eaten our rations and such seals and penguins as we could get, then and then, without any enmity, we looked at one another. <sighs> wow. Each day, Wilde roused the company from their bags with the cry, lash up and stow, the bus may come today. But by the end of August, even Wilde had given up hope that Shackleton would return. Orly summarized the situation. The idea of a ship ever coming now is getting more and more remote, as preparations are being pushed along for sending one of our two boats. Wilde and four other members are to go in the Dudley Docker and will make their way from island to island of the South Shetlands until they reach Deception Island, about 250 miles away. It is a big undertaking. On August 30th, 1916, the men were gathered in their hut for a lunch of boiled seal backbone. Marston and Hurley remained outside, shelling limpets picked in the shallows. Suddenly, Marston put his head inside the hut. Macklin recalled. Marston burst in asking if it would not be a good thing to send up smoke. Wilde called out to know what was the matter, and Marston replied with the magic words, A SHIP! Wow. Can you imagine? From the, the deck feeling. of the Yancho, Shackleton scanned Cape Wilde through binoculars, counting the figures who poured out of the hut onto the beach. Frank Worsley recalled, two, five, seven, and then an exultant shout, they're all there, Skipper, they're all safe. Every one of those motherfuckers survived. Green That's how words. much of a badass Shackleton we was. All unable to speak. He didn't lose a single fucking man through that entire two-year journey. That's a fucking man. That is some balls there. All hands were safe. Not one life had been lost. Whew. That is just, that's fucking Next incredible. Next welcome greeted Shackleton and Punta Arenas. Although Germany was at war with Britain, the German community raised flags of celebration. The crew of the Endurance returned to a British nation that little resembled the one they had left two years before. When Shackleton and his men had left England, the Great War had just started, and their minds were still in Edwardian England. But when they returned to civilization now, they entered the modern world, and the war, as it turned out, was beyond their comprehension. And you survived for two years to come to this. On the battlefields in Europe, Shackleton rather disappeared. And in any case, he was the wrong kind of hero for England at the time. The British wanted dead heroes, and they had lots and lots of dead heroes. Humans are so effing cool, right, Printer God? I suspect in 1918, the death of so many people in the trenches in the war made them feel that they had been, I could have said, nearly cowards, that they had avoided two years of the war and they were lucky to be alive. 
See, and after they survive all of that, they felt like Most cowards the because the they weren't in the war. The so they all went to the war, yeah. Frank Hurley went off to photograph the fighting in the trenches. Tim McCarthy would be killed at sea six weeks after enlisting. Jesus. McNish emigrated to New Zealand, working on the docks before suffering a crippling injury. Most members of the expedition were awarded the Polar Medal, but Shackleton withheld this honor from McNish and three others. Hmm. The carpenter's brief rebellion on the ice had cost him dearly. He said he would remember the carpenter. And he did. But why didn't the other two guys get the medal, I wonder? As Shackleton had known, the endurance expedition had been his last chance at glory. In 1921, he headed south once more, joined by a handful of the old endurance crew, Worsley, Macklin, Green, Hussey, and Frank Wilde. They went back for another expedition. The goal of the expedition was unclear. All that mattered was that they were heading south again. After they survived that, they went back for another expedition. On the evening expedition. of his arrival in South Georgia, Shackleton had a heart attack and died. He was not quite 48 years old. At the request of his wife, his men buried him in the island's small whaling cemetery. He's five years younger than me when he died. I'm fucking useless. Jesus. Yeah. Bereft, Could you have done this? Shackleton's I couldn't. Man continued their uncertain expedition. Along the way, they took time to visit a place they never thought they would see again. Elephant Island. The expedition photographer recorded their visit. <sighs> Confronting the sight of their dark winter, they were overcome with unexpected nostalgia. Hmm. Macklin. We have stood gazing with binoculars, picking out and recognizing old familiar spots. Ah, what memories. What Jeez. memories. They rush to one like a great flood and bring tears to one's eyes. And as I sit and try to write, a great rush of feeling comes over me and I find I cannot express myself. Once more I see the old faces and hear the old voices. Old friends scattered everywhere. But to express it all, I feel, is impossible. Grifter Wannabe says, Now I realize why Shackleton tried so many times to get to the South Pole. The he needed to get his fix for dog. In his memoir. We had seen God in his splendors, heard the text that nature renders. We had reached the naked soul of man. So there you have it. The long story of Shackleton's expedition on the endurance. Not a single person died on that. That is, I, there, there's not even, there's not even really a word to describe what that was. I mean, that's just insane. That's just crazy that that guy got all, was it 26 people, 27 people back, 26 people, I think it was back without a single person dying. I, said, I, I know I've said it before, and I'm saying they just don't make people like that. I mean, like I said, I'm 53, five years older than he was when he died. I'm, I'm useless. 
Uh, Execution says, I'm 40 and I had a heart attack in May this year and survived. Eww. The wrong people die. No, nah, you made it. That's the important thing. Thanks for the super chat. Ugh. Hunch the dirty roofer, long time no see. Thanks so much for the super chat. God had to take him early. He knew the world couldn't handle a man with cojones the size of Range Rovers. Right? I mean, God. I told you guys <laughs> two weeks ago, this story is in you cannot you couldn't make a movie like this if you made a movie where all of these things happened getting stuck in the ice having to stay there over a winter in the pitch blackness for months and months losing the ship just days perhaps weeks before you could leave then having to walk through across the island while it's rotating and then you have to take a boat to some island you can't get there because of the wind, so you have to go to some other stupid island you didn't want, and then you have to split up while some guy takes a makeshift sailboat that he just made 800 miles through the most dangerous waters on planet Earth through two hurricanes to get where he's going, and then they have to climb over 1,000-foot cliffs and march for two, two and a half days to get to, well, a day and a half to get to a base camp and then make four rescue attempts to get the guys and not lose one. People would walk out of that damn theater halfway through that movie just claiming utter BS because you wouldn't buy that if it was fiction. Yeah, it would make an incredible movie. But like I said, if, if you couldn't write this because you would be ashamed, you'd be like, okay, this is just too over the top and nobody would watch it. Yeah, navigating with a watch and a sextant where you can only take four readings during this entire 17-day sailing through two hurricanes. <sighs> yeah, Liam Neeson should star in it now. Uh, personally, he's too old. He's way older than 48. When he, and that's when he died. He was in his mid-40s, mid to early 40s when he started, when, when uh, Shackleton started this expedition. Ugh. Man, I mean, that's, that is just a phenomenal story. And I, like I said, I wanted to share it with you. I know we usually only do one week things. And so we just kind of gave the uh, Reader's Digest condensed version last week. But there was this. And this needed to happen. You guys needed to see this. I wanted to share this with you, regardless of whether or not YouTube pulls the plug on the demonetization. And uh, I put a link in the chat where the original video is in the original channel. Go visit this guy's channel. He's got some great videos there. Uh, and this is just one of them. So if, if you ever happen to watch this, wonder who the hell is copying your video, it's me. And I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Uh, Flux, thank you so much for perhaps the last super chat. The truth is often stranger than... Yeah, we don't need that to happen. Um, hello? <laughs> hello? Here we are. We're back. That was weird. <sighs> yep. Um, what you just saw there, perchance, was, uh, was me bringing up the, uh, bringing up the video for, uh, the next stream, which is Law and Crime. Law and Crime's video always makes us buffer. <laughs> He said, we watched this whole entire hour and a half, not a single glitch. I bring up the, uh, law, and, the law and crime stream for the uh, murder trial we're getting into. And uh, that happened. So it's going to be one of those nights, I guess. Uh, it's going to be a buffering night over on Law and Crime. So what's going to happen now? I'm going to end this stream with a sincere thanks to the mods who showed up and stuck through this, even though we finished, we started a little bit early today. And thank you to everyone that, that uh, participated in the chat. You guys are awesome. And uh, thank you so much again for the for the super chats that came in. We were kind of focused on <laughs> things other than what was being shown on the screen, but deeply, deeply appreciated nonetheless. You guys are awesome. Appreciate it all. And for those of you that are just listening in the background as you go about your day or night's work, pleasure to have you here. Please stop in and hit that like button. We didn't get a we didn't get 500 likes yet. So, but on your way out. Right now, in the next 30 seconds, there's a perfect opportunity to reach down there and hit that like button. Do me that favor. Let's get us up over 500 likes so YouTube can be more motivated than usual to uh, get the word of the channel out there. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. I would appreciate that as well. So what's going to happen now? Uh, we're going to uh, end this. And again, it may or may not work out. Sometimes it does for people. Sometimes it doesn't for people. Dump you automatically into my next stream, which starts in five minutes. The uh, murder trial of Matthew Terry, who is being charged with murder, and the prosecutors are seeking the death penalty. 
uh, for stabbing his girlfriend lots of times and slitting her throat. Uh, the prosecution may be calling an old girlfriend who was also stabbed in the throat by him uh, or later today. And so join me for that. We'll have a fun time. I've invited some people. Uh, hopefully someone will show up to keep me company through the long, dark night of the soul. Uh, all righty. Thank you so much. Uh, we're up to 480, so we almost got 500. This is your last chance to help an old an old man out here. Uh, 81, we got 19 more in the next 15 seconds when I'm going to wrap this up again. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Love you all. We'll see you on the flip side. If you don't get dumped automatically into my next stream, just go to Legal Vices, my channel, and click on the uh, live video, and that will get you where you need to go. Until we meet again, there's only four of you that need to click that like button to get to a 500, so I'll assume it's, there's two more. All right, let's just do this. Two more likes, and then we can end this, and we can go do the next stream. Just two more likes. Who's going to be the two likes? If you haven't hit that like button, just get down there and smash that like so we get 500. We're out of here. See you all on the flip side. If you don't get there, go to Legal Vices. Get back here. Tech to you later. You guys are awesome, and enjoy your Legal Vices.